Thank you all for being here. Uh, just another note on the questions. We've saved a healthy amount of time for Q&A at the end. They want to, you know, for recording sessions, if you want to ask a burning question in the middle, please do just raise your hand and I'll repeat the question, but save most of your questions to the end if you can. So first off, good afternoon. Thank you all for being here. We definitely appreciate you making time. Uh, I want to start off by just sort of a couple contextual questions and by show of hands or you can hoot or you can do something else as an affirmative. But first question is, have you ever seriously attempted to measure your impact? Okay, a little bit less than half probably, but a good number. Second question is, have you ever heard of the terms logic model or theory of change? Slightly fewer, but still a, a decent amount. Okay, good, so we've got some baseline knowledge in here, but hopefully this will be new material to most of you. If you don't know who I am, my name is Che Green. I'm the founder and executive director of an organization called Phonolytics. We were, until very recently, called the Humane Research Council, and we've been doing this work for about 15 years. And what we strive to do essentially is provide data and research to help advocates be as effective as possible in their work for animals. Now, if you're an astute advocate, that begs the question, what is effective? And so we spend a lot of time, on thinking, a lot of time thinking about what is effective, effectiveness in terms of different programs, et cetera. And then that raises another question, which is what is impact? And how do we define the impact that we're having and how do we measure it? And so that is my goal for today to help, hopefully help everyone in this room get a, a bit of an understanding of what impact is, maybe what it isn't, which is often what we're focused on are things other than impact. It's something that I think many of us think is obvious at first. What is impact and are we having an impact? It's whether or not it's a binary question, yes or no, but it's, it's much more nuanced than that. And impact, we have to strive to really understand what impact is beyond most of the things that we measure right now. And so as Milton Friedman said, it's not about your intentions, it's not even really about your activities or the outputs that result from that, those activities. It's about the results. It's about keeping our eye on the prize, which is the ultimate goal we're trying to change or create for animals. If you're going to remember or think about in depth one thing or one set of things from this conversation, this is what I'd like you to focus on, is that understanding and measuring impact is incredibly important. My guess is that you get that already because you're in this room but it's also incredibly hard to do accurately. And that's going to be a theme throughout my presentation. So don't let me be too daunting to you because even though it's incredibly hard, I also think it's incredibly necessary. And that even if you can't get all the way to a complete understanding of what your impact is, you can still learn a lot from simply going through the process and identifying some of those near-term outcomes that can serve as surrogates, if you will, for your impact. And so don't be daunted, or at least too daunted by it, but do understand that it's a difficult process and one that you can't take on lightly. Our recommendation, and we get asked this all the time, our recommendation at Fonalix is to smart, start small and be very focused. So you may have a small set of programs or a lot of programs. Pick one, may not be your, your main program. Pick one and then pick a single objective or goal for that program or campaign and focus on trying to measure that. And then you can take what you've learned from that process and hopefully apply it to your other programs, your main programs, what have you, your organization overall. So again, start small, be focused with your impact measurement. It might help to define impact a little bit more closely. And this is sort of a, an amalgam of different definitions that I've pulled together over the years and tried to simplify it a li little bit. And so I would argue that impact is the long-term and aggregate effect of a program, service, or intervention on the target population. Now let's just look at those components real quick. I, I highlight long-term, not because short-term impacts can't also be meaningful, but I would argue that everybody in this room is focused on long-term sustained change for animals. That is our metric for success, I would argue. And so we need to be thinking about impact in terms of the long-term. That makes it harder to measure, it makes it more difficult, but that's the, the kind of mindset that we need to have. It's not just a short-term, you know, did you, uh, for instance, you did a showing of earthlings, let's say, right? And you had 500 people attend. And you find out, you know, uh, a third of them decided to change their behavior. But how long have they changed that behavior for? If they went vegetarian for a week, that's a far different impact that you've had than if they went vegan for life. And so you just need to sort of categorize what that impact is. So that's why we look long term. Aggregate refers to the fact or acknowledges the fact that your program may have many different components or that your messaging may be layered over time. And so you need to look at what is the combined or cumulative or aggregate effect of all of those different components. And we'll talk a little bit about how to break up and identify those components here in a minute. 
And then just briefly, a last note on target population. You know, uh, we've been doing this work for a long time, and over a decade ago, pretty much everybody thought of their target population as the general public. And sure, 98% of people out there, we want to change in some way to be more uh, compassionate toward animals. But you need to be thinking more niche, more nuanced in terms of your target selection. It's not only helpful in terms of your advocacy, it's also a lot easier to measure against a niche population than it is against the broader general public in most cases. Impact measurement starts with identifying the goal. And so the goal, I would argue, for most people in this room is to reduce suffering or to save lives, some sort of derivation of, of those concepts. And whether it's chickens in hatcheries, or it's hens, or it's cats in shelters, or it's rats and mice in animal testing laboratories. Our goal is to either prevent some animals from being born into cruel conditions, or to reduce or rescue them from cruel conditions, or, or things like that. Change behaviors that would result in fewer animals, all of those kinds of things sort of make up our goal. And they, they all feed into what is our long-term and ultimate goal of trying to reduce suffering for those animals. But the problem is, and I alluded to this earlier, is that reduction in suffering is incredibly hard to measure, right? So we can't always connect what our activities are doing in terms of changing behavior, and then a further step is to see what behavior change we've created, what impact is that actually having on animals. Not easy to do. There's so many assumptions that are involved. You have to do research, which is certainly my bailiwick, but there's, there's a lot of component pieces to that. And so often what we have to do is fall back to proxies for impact. At least that's what I refer to them as. First off, don't just rely on anecdotal evidence. Sometimes that may be all you have, at least all you have at hand. But anecdotal evidence, for those who don't know, is simply personal stories or personal experiences. And those are rarely representative of your target population. So don't rely on those, especially don't rely on those for making any big decisions or any major program choices. You can rely on them perhaps for very small things, but not for big decisions. Attitude change, many of us are really trying to change attitude almost as our end goal in many cases, trying to improve attitudes towards animals, trying to increase the sphere of compassion to include animals among our target population. But that stops short of that overall goal of reducing suffering. And in fact, all of these, except for that last one, stop short of that goal. That's why they're proxies. But they're arguably, some of these are arguably getting very close to that goal. And sort of as you go down the list, I think they get closer and closer. So attitude change is important, and we often do want to measure that. It's, it's a pretty loose proxy, though, for impact. A better one is behavior change, but we don't always have the ability to actually catalog behavior change for a given target audience. So we might look at, at intent to change instead. So again, let's say you did that screening of earthlings or the ghosts in our machine, and the idea is that you want to survey people immediately after and get an idea of what their intent is in terms of their behaviors or attitudes well, you can measure attitudes immediately, but their intent in terms of the behavior that they might change down the road. That's a proxy for the actual impact that you're going to have, because we know that not everybody who says that they're going to intend to change their behavior will actually change it. And we don't even know what that drop-off is in most cases. And so it's, it's removed from the ultimate impact you're trying to achieve, but it's still a very important thing to try to measure. Now, if you can go further than intent to change and actually look at behavior change, then you're doing even better. What that requires, though, in most cases, is having a baseline understanding of someone's behavior. So if it's, if it's a documentary screening, you need to get a baseline survey of their attitudes, awareness, and knowledge, maybe their activism, certainly their dietary habits. And then later, you'd have to follow up immediately to get the short-term effects, and then long-term to actually understand what the sustained behavior change is. So again, that's where it starts to get complicated, but that's the closer and closer we're getting to the ultimate impact we're trying to have. There's a concept of outcomes versus impact, and I'm gonna talk a lot about that here in just a moment with an example, but outcomes are really the shorter term or more in intermediate steps to the ultimate impact you're trying to achieve. They go beyond just the direct results of the work you're doing and look at things like satisfaction, looking at things like short-term behavior change, all of that. It doesn't necessarily get to the suffering that's been reduced, but it starts to get you a lot closer to that. And so let's look at a mechanism that helps sort of delineate between these different components. This is what's called a logic model. And this is just one example. There are a ton of them out there. This is a, a fairly basic one. It often breaks things into five different components. And this is for evaluating a program or planning a program. And we'll just walk through each one of these briefly. So the first one is inputs. It's pretty straightforward. That's the funding you have for a program. 
That's the staff and volunteer time you have for a program. It's the equipment you have, materials, things of that sort. The, number two is the activities in which you engage. So that might be, for instance, leafleting, or it might be any of the number of activities that I'm sure people in here, here do for animals. The outputs are the direct results from those activities. So if, it's, if your activity is leafleting, the outputs are the number of people you've leafleted. Outcomes then take that further. Actually, let me back up. So that's where most people stop, is at outputs. And that's why we're having this conversation. Because a lot of people use their outputs as, their prox as a proxy for the impact that they're having. So we leafleted X number of people. We did X number of spay neuter surgeries. We you know, handed out, an, or, or our PSA reached X number of people. Those are not a measure of your impact. Those are a measure of your outputs. And that's the delineation that I think is probably most important for this conversation today and for you to take away, is that you need to be focusing more on that right-hand side, those outcomes and the impact to get a better understanding of what it is you're doing for animals. We don't have time to really go in, into it in depth, but also down below you see context, conditions, and external factors. Even if you went through and did a completely robust impact evaluation, there's always going to be external factors that may complicate things. Um, those external factors may influence the program as a whole, or it may influence any one of those constituent pieces. But it's important to acknowledge that there are things that are beyond our control. There are environmental influences that also play into our ability to be effective in our programs. So for a quick example, I'm simplifying the model even further and grouping it into three different steps. First, still inputs, and I think activities and outputs fairly logically go together since they're directly related. And then outcomes, again, are sort of the short-term or intermediate steps toward your impact, so those sort of make sense to go together as well. We still need to think about context and conditions. But this is the mechanism I want to use to think about just a quick example to hopefully underscore or highlight how you might use a model like this to evaluate something. It also will underscore some of the challenges. So what are the inputs that went into the talk today? Using this workshop as an example, and like for instance, if I were to try to measure my impact vis-a-vis -vis this workshop. The inputs are pretty straightforward. Time, the time that I spent to develop the slides, the hopefully the knowledge and slight expertise that I bring to bear on the subject, uh, the money to pay for airfare and hotel, simple stuff like that, and then the equipment. You know, we're using a laptop, we're using a screen, you're sitting on chairs, all that. Pretty straightforward stuff. Gets slightly more complicated when we get into activities and outputs. Identifying the activity itself, easy, right? It's the workshop right now. And then outputs, we start to get, that's where it starts to get a little bit harder in that, okay, reach. Well, what is the reach? The reach, arguably, I could just count the number of people in this room, and that could be the reach. But maybe that's undercounting. If you're going off and talking to somebody else and sharing the information, maybe we're getting people listening to the session afterward. So trying to evaluate reach gets slightly more complicated than simply describing the inputs of the activities. One step further would be something like satisfaction, which I would not be able to do myself on my own. I would need your input. Like, let's call satisfaction the interest you have in the topic or the amount that you feel like you've learned about the topic. Now, if I wanted to measure that, I'd need to ask, to ask you. And if I wanted to measure that in a really robust fashion, again, I would do that before and after survey to create a baseline of your level of knowledge and awareness of the topic, compare that with the post-evaluation, and that would be my truest sense of impact on your knowledge of the topic. Not as easy to do. Again, you know, I asked you those two questions at the beginning to try to give you a sense of what that would be like. That's a very loose way to do it, of course. A survey would be much better. And then we get into the third area, which is hopefully where the magic happens. Now, what we would like to do, what I, my goal ultimately is to save more animals with this talk, to reduce suffering by the, by the impact that I have on your activism. I have no chance of measuring that because what would have to happen in order to, to do that is I'd have to go through each of these steps. So first off, I'd have to figure out the learning. We just talked about that, that ties to satisfaction. I could do before and after surveys with you guys and figure out how much you learned and get a pretty good idea of that. Application becomes a different story. So if you're going to apply that knowledge, it may be a month from now, it may be three years from now, I don't know, and it could be in any one of number of different ways. So I'd have to have the ability to follow up with you later and figure out how you've actually applied the information. Beyond that, I would actually have to figure out how the application of that knowledge has influenced your work. To what extent has it improved your programs? Has it made you more effective? That in itself, an incredibly difficult question to answer. And then we'd have to translate that into animals saved or suffering reduced. 
So it gets very complicated very quickly, which is why I encourage everyone to look at those proxies and to take a sort of a step back from that ultimate goal of impact. If you have the resources to do it, great, but most of us don't. And so take, again, take a step back and start to look at some of those proxies, what we call <coughs> outcomes, which are the near term, hopefully steps that lead toward the ultimate impact that you want to have. So again, not to be daunting, please do start with this process. Start somewhere, start small, be focused, and start to apply the, a truer understanding of impact to your work for animals. Now, if you want to take it to the next level, if logic models feel a little bit too simplistic for you, you can. Uh, logic models are very descriptive and explanatory, whereas something like a theory of change is considered more predictive. And the, um, just want to make sure everything's okay. Uh, theories of change are a little bit more complicated to, to, take, to undertake, but they're also more valuable because of it. And so the idea, there's a few distinctive points about theories of change, I'll cover them briefly. Um, they always start with the end goal. Now, with a logic model, you can work forwards or backwards, going from your resources to identify what impact you can have, or you can start from your impact and work back and see what resources you need to create that impact. A theory of change always starts with the impact first, and then you work backwards to try to figure out what causal steps could actually lead to the impact that you're trying to change. It's, it's what's called a causal model. Um, and that's where it gets more complicated, because at each one of those steps to validate what you think you have to do in order to create the change you want, you have to do research, you have to uh, uh, validate all of these assumptions, and it becomes much more intensive effort. Again, it's incredibly useful if you can go through the process, but it's not an easy one to do. Logic models and theories of change are just two examples. I, I, whatever tool or model that you use, the old, ultimate goal is to try to take a more strategic approach to our ad advocacy for animals, to really focus on what's effective and what impact we're having. As I start to wrap up, just a few quick points for you. Yeah. Um, if you have any hope at all of measuring your impact, you need to start with clear and measurable goals. Now again, reduced suffering may not be measurable. So identify those interim steps that will get you to reduced suffering that you can actually measure and focus on those. And then you can move on to something like a logic model or a theory of change to delineate between the different components of your program and hopefully figure out how they interact and feed into one another. And then use research to validate your assumptions, especially in that theory of change model, you're going to need to use research to, to show the causality of the different components. Not quite as necessary with the logic model, which is why it might be a good starting place for people who are new to impact measurement. Don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good, is something I like to say. So again, don't be daunted by it. Don't think that you have to have a perfectly accurate assessment of your impact in order to just start the process. Simply going through the process will be incredibly helpful for your organization and for your program, I guarantee it. And as a wise man once said, uh, not everything that counts can necessarily be counted. Lastly, use help. Use the experts, if that's what we can be called in this field, myself and Allison. And then on logic models, uh, the W.K. Kellogg Foundation is known as being one of the leaders in that field. They have a lot of different evaluation tools that are available for free. The Aspen Institute is one of the leaders in theories of change. Phonolytics.org, if you'd like to know what other research is being conducted around animal issues. We also provide direct services for animal groups to help them measure their work. And then I'm always happy to provide advice to anyone who wants it. So that's it. Thank you all for your time. My name is Allison. I'm the research manager at Animal Charity Evaluators, and I'm going to talk to you now about interpreting and applying research. Now, I'm going to talk about something slightly different than what Che has been talking about. I'm going to talk about research that other people have already done, or research that you might do in going out and looking for resources bearing on a question you have in mind. So I hope that some of you in this room are thinking, but what I really want to do is test the impact of my personal program. But I think of that as sort of the advanced stage. And before you want to do that, you want to look at what's already out there and what kinds of questions have been asked and what kinds of questions can be useful to you. So even if that's your ultimate goal, I think that this talk should help provide you some resources to get started on moving toward achieving that goal. 
So the first question is why research? And Che's already given us a really good answer to that. You might do some research because you're curious, but more likely you're doing research to inform your decisions and improve your effectiveness as an advocate for animals. Research can help you organize information that might not be organized in your mind when you start. It can help provide access to types of information that you might not have access to otherwise. For instance, if you have a program where you work with people and you don't follow up with them normally, you might be able to find research that has followed up with people who've gone through a similar program and know what people are experiencing six months or a year after they leave your classroom or after they leave your sanctuary. So I'm gonna talk about some abstract things. So I wanna talk about them in as concrete a way as I possibly can, which means I'm gonna use one example throughout this talk. The example is going to be of a single decision. Imagine that I am pre preparing to give humane education presentations in high school classrooms about factory farming. Now, there would be a lot of decisions I'd have to make in preparing that presentation, but one big one is what kinds of videos to use or whether to use videos at all. I could ask how long to show videos for as opposed to talking myself. I could ask what particular videos to show or even more basic questions like what kind of content should those videos have? What should the tone be? Should they be the grim videos of factory farm suffering or the happy videos of chickens in sanctuaries? There's a ton of questions I might have and I might not know the answers as I start. So I would go out and I would try to do research. And I might start in any of a number of ways. I might start by talking to people in my personal network. That's fun. And it's part of why we're all here today. We are all here at this conference because we all have questions and we all hope that other animal advocates can help us with the answers. So talking to people and learning from other people is a great way to do research. Another way, of course, is to use the computer. So I could type my question into Google and Google will give me thousands of results and some of them, but not all of them, will be meaningful in addressing my question. Of course, there will be so many every time you type a question into Google. There's so many results, you can't possibly get through all of them. And that can be really confusing. So one other place to go on your computer while you're doing research is to the Faunalytics website run by Che and his team. Uh, they have a carefully curated database of articles and resources and studies that specifically deal with questions that animal advocates might want the answers to. So you can get back many fewer results, which you can look at all of, and many more of them, percentage-wise, will be to do with your actual question and will have relevance. So those are three places we might start looking. Once we're there, we'll find a huge variety of resources. So I'm gonna talk you through several kinds. Of course, these are not the only kinds, and each of these kinds could be further divided. Uh, but my point here is that all of them have pros and cons, and I'm not gonna tell you to only use this one or only use that one, but I want you to know about what I think the pros and cons are so that you can make an informed decision in weighing what evidence you find as you go about your own research. So let's start with anecdotes, the personal stories. They're really easy to find. It's really easy to find someone who has had an experience that is somehow relevant to your question. So to my question, I might find someone who has had experience talking to high schoolers or showing videos to high schoolers. I might find someone who has seen one of the videos I'm considering using or showed it to a friend or family member and can tell me the story of how that went. Or I might even find online people talking about videos they've seen. So that's the first positive of anecdotes. They're really accessible. No matter what your question is, you are always able to find someone with an anecdote. And the second positive is that we as humans have brains that really understand stories. And so whenever we see a story, when someone tells us a story, it's easy for us to absorb that information and it's fairly easy for us to decide whether that story sounds plausible and trustworthy. Now, let's get to the cons. As Che said, anecdotes aren't always representative. So as we get that story information and it feels so juicy to us, we might not realize that we can't take that as the last word. But maybe we could. We maybe we'll realize because maybe we'll ask lots of people and we'll hear lots of anecdotes and we'll realize they contradict each other, so some of them must be biased. 
but we don't know which ones to take as representative because we can't really add up in our head how many times we heard this story versus that story. That's not what our brains are good at. Anecdotes can quickly become confusing if you have a lot of them. And if you don't have a lot, you don't know that they're representative because you know you could have a lot and they'd all be different. They can also be biased as a group. For example, if I ask people here today what farm animal video they've seen that was most powerful for them, the answers I get will be biased towards the videos that have been recently released and the videos that a lot of people have seen because that'll just be the ones that people are thinking about. There might be a video that would be just as powerful when I have the chance to show whatever I want to high schoolers or more powerful that people haven't seen or saw a long time ago and aren't thinking about. So there's a lot of downsides to anecdotes and we might go looking for other resources. Something I want to pull out is a little bit separate from anecdotes is expert opinion. I could talk to an expert here at this conference. There's lots of people who've given humane education presentations here. Or on the internet, I could look for people who've given humane education presentations and written about them. Or for instance, here's Katie Cantrell of the Factory Farming Awareness Coalition giving her presentation on a YouTube video that I can watch and I can see what video clips she uses and think about why she chose what she chose. Now the positives of expert opinions are firstly, just like anecdotes, they often come to us in sort of a story format, which is easy for us to understand and digest. And secondly, that experts are experts for a reason. Their judgments are incorporating many, many sources because they have a lot of experience in the field. They might be incorporating sources like surveys, and other research that I could go out and find. And they might just be incorporating a huge number of anecdotes from every time they've gone into a classroom and given a presentation and seen someone respond. But in any case, these are really information heavy, rich sources of opinion. They're much better than my friend who just showed a video once to her mom. The negatives are that it can be hard to evaluate which experts are more reliable than other experts as you start hearing many opinions if they're contradictory, it can be difficult for the non-expert to figure out who to listen to. And secondly, experts might not remember everything that went into forming their opinion. If they saw a survey once a long time ago that showed that a particular video was really powerful, and now they use that video and also have a lot of anecdotes about how powerful it was, they may or may not remember to say, oh yeah, and I saw this survey, which reinforces my point about this video, which means that when you go out and see that survey, you might think it's totally unconnected to what the expert was saying, and that you have two pieces of information, when really those two pieces of information are tightly connected. So the fact that experts don't know exactly why they think everything they think, just like the rest of us, means that their opinions have some uh, obscurities and some parts that you might not understand quite as well as you think you do. So you might look for more objective information. And the first place you might want to go there is looking at surveys. So these are great because they do aggregate information. Just the way that we can't tell which anecdotes are representative, a survey is going to show you which answers are most representative. So here, someone surveyed a lot of vegans and asked them why they became vegan. And we can see that actually seeing a video is a really representative answer. A lot of people said that. And they provided comments. And we could scroll through the comments and count all the times we see specific videos mentioned in them. So this is answering a big void that we had from anecdotes where we didn't know what was prevalent. Surveys can show us what's prevalent in a population. Secondly, as far as things that are giving us kind of numerical objective data, surveys are relatively easy to understand. We're really familiar with seeing them. We know that people were asked questions and they gave responses and that was the basic procedure. So those are pros. Now to the cons. Beyond that basic picture of what a survey is, it can be hard to tell what are the benefits and drawbacks of a particular survey. So for example, in my situation, this survey has a drawback, which is that people who answered this survey were vegans in internet communities of vegans and animal advocates. And the people I'm talking to in classrooms are random high schoolers. Those two groups are not the same. 
So the answers that the vegans gave might not be the same as the answers that the high schoolers would give after we showed them the same uh, inputs. That kind of thing can be difficult to notice when you see a survey that asks a question that's really close to the question you want to ask. It's tempting to just take it as the answer, but it might be the answer for a different group of people than the one you were really talking about. It can also be really hard to find a survey that's in the right context because surveys are expensive and difficult to conduct and can be especially difficult to conduct in particular contexts. So for example, when I went to look for answers to my question I had for this talk, I could not find a survey of high school students that talked to me about what kinds of videos they found powerful to see in humane education lectures. The best I could do was this survey of vegans. So you might not find anything that bears really directly on your question. And thirdly, unlike with anecdotes or with expert opinions where you're consulting a specific person, you cannot go back in and ask new questions with a survey. This survey was a big undertaking. If you now want to ask more questions about the videos these people saw, you can't go out and recontact every one of the thousand people who answered this question. You're just stuck with the amount of data that you have there, whereas you could continue to talk to the expert or continue to talk to the friend telling you an anecdote. So you might go looking for more information. Sticking with the objective sources, you might look at experimental research. So research that's been done in labs or other carefully controlled settings. In this case, the experimenters found some young people. They chose randomly which video to show which person. And they watched the amount of time the person spent on the video, what sections they rewatched, and at the end they asked them questions. So this is data that would be really hard to get in a survey situation. People aren't going to remember at what moment they stopped watching the video. So this is really cool. And another thing that's really cool, this is the huge pro of experimental research, is that they were able to test a specific aspect of the situation, removing other sources of input. So, as I hear anecdotes, the people who saw Farm to Fridge and the people who chose to see A Life Connected might just be different types of people who hang in different crowds or like to see different things. Whereas in this experiment, no one had a choice. So we can assume that they were pretty similar people and any differences in their responses are really about the video. That's great. Um, this is almost the only place where we can really see what causality is as opposed to correlation, as opposed to things that just happen together a lot and we don't know which one of them is driving the other. Finally, like surveys, experimental situations often use data for many participants, add it up, tell you what experiences were representative. So that's filling again the void in uh, the personal story background of your experience. The negatives are that just like surveys, these are really exp expensive and difficult to conduct. So firstly, it's hard to find them and you might not find them in the right context or measuring the thing you wanted to have measured. Secondly, because they're hard to conduct, they're also hard to understand all the aspects that go into them. If they have flaws, you might not in initially notice the flaws. If you see them reported on elsewhere, the reporting might be hard to understand. And if it's easy to understand, you have to worry about whether the reporter understood the original question <laughs> research correctly or not. So that is a challenge. However, the data that they produce is so valuable because they are able to tease out causality from correlation so much better than other methods. Finally, I want to talk a little bit about case studies, which I'm going to mean by this any place that you see an expert writing a lot of detail about a specific situation that's relevant. So in this case, this case study is the impact report that was written about the ghosts in our machine. They went through and they wrote about every stage from the production to the release to the release on the internet to surveying people who saw the movie on the internet. And so you can see a lot of information that experts felt was relevant about the release of this particular movie. 
You might also find case studies where somebody's talking about a specific high school classroom's response to humane education in the days and weeks following the lecture. A case study can be on anything, but the big pro is that it's written by an expert in a lot of detail, so you can help learn about how experts organize their thinking about the topic. And it can often be very interesting, especially if it's presented in a story format. The negatives are that, primarily, it might not apply directly to your context. So for example, this case study here, they didn't really show this video in parts of humane education presentations in high school classrooms. So I would have to think really hard about what they're saying in the impact report that does or does not apply to my setting. Uh, I have to do a lot of work. Additionally, because they're often about such a specific topic, they might be written by someone who's very biased or who wants to show that this particular video had a huge impact or didn't have a huge impact or this was a great thing to do in their classroom. Um, so you do have to be mindful of that kind of uh, influence on what's being said. So now that everything has a pro and con, what's the solution? The solution is to use as much data as you can find and as many different kinds of sources as you can find. Don't just stick to one thing or one person. Um, and once you're doing that, you want to weight some things heavily and others less heavily. So things that I think you should weight really heavily are expert opinion. Those are opinions of people who are really learned in a topic and their experience and also any research they've done is important. Um, sources that apply directly to your context, and really good surveys and experiments. So again, good surveys and experiments have been well conducted, are aggregating a lot of data and showing you which is representative. You want to weight anecdotes less heavily because each one is only telling you about one circumstance, and it might not be representative. You also want to weight sources that apply to a different context less heavily. So for example, if I have a source that tells me that a particular video was really powerful when people saw it one at a time on like a pay-per-view booth, that might be great. But what if it's like powerful at the pay-per-view booth, but a lot of people leave halfway through because it's disgusting and upsetting? So the people who leave at the pay-per-view booth might be the people who are really moved to change. That person might be a person who's like, oh, this is so bad, I can't believe I'm part of this system, I need to change. So that's hugely effective in the pay-per-view setting. But in the humane education setting, that might be a drawback. If only one person in my classroom is gonna leave for that reason, that could distract the whole rest of the classroom. And they might stop watching the video and start watching their classmate run for the door. So having a study that was directly in a context that's similar to mine would be much more helpful. That was a fictional study, by the way. There's not, not dumping on any particular study. Um, finally, you also want to weight less heavily sources that have specific problems. And this can be really hard to figure out what they are, especially with sources like surveys and experiments where a lot of the problems that could be there are in um, statistics. But some problems are noticeable. For instance, if you notice that the source is written by someone who's biased or seems to have a lot of motivation to get you to believe a particular thing, that's a source you want to care about less heavily. Um, or if you notice that the source is measuring outcomes that seem wrong to you and not very connected to the ultimate impact, for instance, measuring the time people spend watching the video and ignoring the questions that they might ask later about intent to change, that can also be a reason to pass on that. Um, but I encourage you, because this is very difficult, oops. <laughs> because this is very difficult, to go to people who can help you understand if there are any specific problems. Find volunteers, find academics, find organizations like Animal Charity Evaluators, Faunalytics, that can help you look at a study or a survey and say, yeah, this is really reliable, or, well, this is fairly reliable, but it doesn't apply directly to your context in these three ways, um, if you're having trouble judging it for yourself. 
So I know these aren't the only things that you'll be thinking about when you do do research, but I hope it's given you some tools that you can use. And I hope you use them because research can have a huge effect on your impact as an advocate for animals. Hi, um, so this question is directed at either of you. I was just curious, um, have there, has any been research um, done to look at like what sort of, um, what is like the profile of a person who would be more likely to make that long-term you know, change or that, you know, as opposed to the, the short-term change like you were talking about, like you know, deciding to, be, to go vegan as opposed to just being vegetarian for a week? Is, or do you know of any? I think I understand your question. So, sort of like psychographic or other preconditions in terms yeah. of people. I'm not aware of that specifically. Okay. Um, it's sort of tangential, but we did a study on semi-vegetarianism and meat reduction that profiled different people in terms of their eating profile. That gets to it a little bit, but really not in terms of long-term, short-term sustained change. So I'm actually not aware of anything specifically around that. Are you, Allison? No, it's, there's very few studies that measure anything about the long term because it's so hard to do. Um, you might look at something like a recidivism study. Mm -hmm. So for instance, people who are plugged into a vegetarian community stay vegetarian for longer. Um, people who feel like vegetarian foods are more available to them stay vegetarian for longer. Um, so there might be some takeaways from that kind of study that it's clear beforehand which group people are going to fall into, but I'm not aware of anything that's directly to your question. Thank you. Thank you for asking. This was a really terrific talk, and I'm very glad that uh, you are here to share all this useful food for thought with everybody. I actually have two questions, which are s sort of related, but I'll split them. The first question is, what do you think should the audience do with the information you gave them today in terms of practical application when they go back in? And you know, please be as kind of specific and concrete and, and, and pragmatic as possible. The second question was, under what circumstances do you think it would be worth for organizations here to do a new in-house comprehensive study versus piecemealing the knowledge from the sources that uh, you talked about and if somebody decided to do a comprehensive, good, well thought out methodical study, what are some of the um, resources or what are, what are some of the uh, you know, tips that you would give to, to start an effort? So I think the, the first thing that I want people to do when they go home is to think about what is the biggest decision that you make in your life as an animal advocate that could change based on finding out information that you might not have. And write that down, and write down what information you need, and then go out and look and see if that information is out there or if that's information that you would need to generate yourself by doing some kind of study or interviews with people. What would you need in order to answer that question? And what answers would change your conduct as an advocate? Yeah, and just to compliment that, if you work with an organization, you may go back and, and define a part of your board or a committee or something like that to start taking a close look at impact and evaluation if you're not doing it already. And you can start by just using one of those logic model sort of models as, as an example to lay out your different programs and activities, et cetera, and just start there. Like I say, start small, be focused, and, and all of that. So that's like the individual side and the group side. I'm trying to remember what your second question was, I'm sorry. Thank you, thank you. So the rule of thumb in the business world is about seven to eight percent of a campaign budget should be spent on research. Now, whether you apply that to nonprofit world or not, that's the rule of thumb in the business world, generally speaking. Now, it can vary you know, on the complexity of the kind of product you're selling or service. So think about it in terms of a percentage of a, of a budget or resources. If you have a very major program and you're spending a million dollars on it a year, you absolutely should be doing something robust and probably involving a third party, whether it's a for-profit third party or one of our organizations or something like that, involve somebody to help you out with that kind of, it's worth ex the expenditure. So if it's a million dollar campaign, you may be paying, what is that, seven, $70,000 to try to figure out what impact you're having. And I would, I would argue that's a minimum because we're operating in a field where we 
have very little information. Selling products, there's a lot more information around that and around marketing. We have a lot less information. So I think we need to invest more in learning up front because we have so many gaps to fill like Allison was talking about. Is there a widely accepted theory of change for the animal welfare movement? I've been reading some of the literature in uh, effective altruism, and I've not yet run across anything that, that shows one of these types of models. There's not, not for animal advocacy in, t in its entirety. There are many theories of change for individual programs. So for instance, I've worked with the ASPCA and we've developed theories of change around their adoption programs and things like that. I'm working with a veg group next month in Portland, Oregon to try to help them figure it out. So it all depends, it's program specific is the problem because the impact will be different in many cases that you're trying to achieve. Mine will be quick. Uh, Full disclosure, I work with animal charity evaluators. Uh, but I just wanted to answer a little bit of that last question in terms of what tips you could use for people who are going to take an attempt to evaluate their own programs in some way. Both Faunalytics and animal charity evaluators work together on a project called the Survey Guidelines Project. It is available on the uh, animalcharityevaluators.org website, and I believe through Faunalytics as well. And it essentially provides a question bank of questions that you can use in follow-up surveys that have been really well thought out, and food frequency questionnaires, general advice about uh, avoiding bias in your surveys. So if it is something you'd like to do, if you'd like to do some sort of research on a program, please do visit our website, talk to one of us afterwards, and we'll be happy to fill, fill you in on some details. No, thank you. Hi, uh, my question is a lot of grassroots organizations will do things like uh, circus protests or they'll do something that they want to get out onto social media um, and they're very difficult obviously to measure because you don't know, you know how many likes in Facebook or how many retweets or how many shares or how many views on YouTube. Uh, you know, we all hope that we're helping to achieve a tipping point where it just becomes part of social consciousness that this is becoming bigger and bigger and bigger, but there's real no quantifiable how many vegans were created or how many elephants were released. Then you have something like Blackfish that, you know, they have a huge impact, uh, the media just takes up on it and the profits of the stocks of SeaWorld start to go down. Any advice on understanding how to build campaigns that aren't just media spectacles that you're just hoping to create? or how do, you, how do you measure those things other than clicks and reshares? It's, it's very resource intensive. Um, that, for instance, like the circus protest idea, and I, I did grassroots activism for many years and we did circus protests. I don't know how to do that other than say surveying the population, right? And so if you did a, a survey of, let's say it's the Seattle area, and you then refine that or screen out everybody who hasn't gone to a survey in the last, or a circus, excuse me, in the last year or something like that. And then you whittle down that audience to the relevant audience. It's gonna be very expensive to do that survey, especially to do before and after if you want a baseline. So it's doable, but is that commensurate with the amount you're investing in the program? Probably not. And so I, I would say maybe don't do it in that case and just try to be as robust as possible in, in your impact evaluation, acknowledging the constraints you have for the different programs. It's not, a, it's not a great answer, but it's the best one I've got. Yeah, I would say if anything, um, the only advice I can think of there is see if you can think of some intermediate goals that are between <coughs> likes on Facebook and total so societal change. You know? <laughs> are you looking for the circus to come back to town next year to a smaller venue? Are you looking for the circus to skip your town next year? Like, is there, is there some intermediate goal that you can look for and see if you're achieving? My name is Gary Shapiro with Statistics Without Borders. Uh, the, if you're looking to do some kind of an evaluation, I, my organization represents a third resource in addition to their great resources. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so come talk to me if you're interested. We, we're a, a group of all volunteer statisticians. We have no budget at all, absolutely zero, zero money. 1,400 statisticians are members of our group. So we represent another, another organization that, that can help you with evaluations. And actually, Chase organization and, and mine have worked together. So come talk to me, or you can check us on the website, Statistics Without Borders. And it's statistics, 
It's not statisticians. Statisticians without borders is a totally unrelated group. So <laughs> statistics without borders. Statisticians without borders is a for-profit consulting group. So we wanted to use that name and we couldn't use it because they already took it. So. Hi. Um, I talked to you before on ACE, at the ACE table, so I'm sorry I have to ask a hard question, but um, I was inspired by, by Nick Cooney's talk about um, the effectiveness of some charities are thousands of times more effective than other. So that's, that's what I'm really passionate about is effectiveness. So I'm really happy that groups like yours exist that actually measure effectiveness and, and which organizations are more effective than other. Um, which leads me to think, you know, the, the best thing we can do is first measure the organizations that receive the largest amount of money and see how effective they are and compare them to other organizations. I know your top ones like Mercy for Animals and uh, Humane League Labs save animals like almost for a dollar per animal or, or even less. So my question was, why is PETA one of the largest, if not the largest recipient of donations not reviewed by ACE. I know that sometimes evaluations can become a little political in nature of what you can say and what you can do, but I'm not criticizing PETA because I know many people that have become vegan because of it, but I would like to push it to have, be more transparent and more efficient and put the numbers out. You know, this is what we're achieving, this is how we're measuring effectiveness. So how do you balance, you know, politics with research to, to make sure that everyone is being as efficient and as transparent as possible? Of course, we love when groups are transparent and efficient. Um, Animal Charity Evaluators is a very new organization, and I think we might not be on the radar of some of the larger organizations, and they might have more bureaucracy to go through to work with us, and so we just uh, wait. <laughs> basically, and if, a, if a, they wanted to be reviewed, of course, we would um, work with them to put out a review that... Um, but if they don't want to be reviewed, then you don't review them? We don't ever publish reviews of groups that don't want us to publish a review because we think that the vast majority of animal charities are doing good work, and we never want to put anything out there that is negative about that work because that can only help people who want to hurt animals and doesn't help animals at all. Um, so we publish reviews only if organizations want us to publish those reviews. But, but wouldn't it help animals if the money was donated to a really effective charity? In well, that's why we have recommendations and we encourage people to donate to those groups, is that those are the groups we've most thoroughly looked at and concluded have very strong cases for their effectiveness. That doesn't mean that other groups aren't effective and they mm -hmm. might be just as effective, but without our knowing about it. Mm -hmm. right. Okay, thank you. Uh, hi, I had a question about using, um, you know, we've been talking about using impact to improve your own organization and your effectiveness, but what about using impact um, to get new members to become vegan? You know, uh, there's pretty much no vegans in Delaware right now, and we've, we, we, you know, we started some groups, and they have names, and they have Facebook pages, but they just don't have any members other than me and, like, my two friends. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I know that I became vegan a lot because of impact. Of, like, I knew the impact of heart disease and the impact of the animals and things like that. So, you know, living in a really podunk town in Delaware, you know, how can I use the impact of being vegan, like, to get people interested in coming to our potluck dinners and screenings and, <laughs> and things like that. Or is that an effective way to get new members? Is, that, is using impact not effective or is that more for the organization itself? So I would think of it more as a, a problem of looking at the impact of your efforts mm -hmm. to get uh, new members, that that's what you want to be uh, paying attention to the impact of. The fact about people is that some of them are really motivated by numbers and by impact, but many people are not very motivated by mm -hmm. hearing about the number of animals they're saving. They're motivated by the story of one animal, or they're mm -hmm. motivated by the story of one person who was impacted by heart disease. Um, and so uh, having a case that depends on like 
large scale impact is going to draw some people, but having alternative cases that depend on other things is might be what you need to do if you're not having success with that story. Thank you. I agree with that. As a numbers guy, it's frustrating, but most people aren't driven by numbers, sadly. Um, I actually took out a slide, just in, for the sake of time, that showed how you can apply a lot of these things internally to an organization. So you can look at, for instance, volunteer hours for an organization, obviously donations or funding, but also the behavior and attitudes of your members, something like that. So you can apply a lot of the same tools, whether it's a logic model or something else, internally as well as externally. I'm really glad to see uh, this effective altruism uh, being increased. And I, I self-identify as a Peter Singer-style utilitarian, so I, I'm, I'm totally on board. On the other hand, um, Peter Singer and other utilitarians will be the first to admit that um, it's a tricky sort of philosophy to live by, uh, you know, trying to identify what it is that you want to maximize or minimize. And so what I'm hearing, it seems a lot recently, is um, you know, we want to reduce suffering. Um, we want to uh, make things better for the greatest number. And that's, that's well known to be problematic you know, in some cases. So for instance, you might actually increase suffering in the near term in order to eliminate the behavior that you're trying to target. Um, I just wonder how you grapple with that sort of thing, uh, or you know, uh, how, how do you identify the, the right metric uh, when you're doing this sort of analysis? And, uh, and it's a difficult message to convey. I mean, already just trying to measure suffering is, as you know, difficult. Uh, and then how do you tell people, uh, well, it may not be exactly just suffering. It may be other things, too, that you have to consider. Like, for instance, um, even though farm sanctuaries are expensive, maybe they, in the greater picture, um, maybe they're also fulfilling a valuable role. Yeah. And the more abstract and long-term you get with it, the harder it is to measure, absolutely. And as you know, utility is a very subjective term in many ways, right? And so we can define utility in different ways and positive and negative utilities. Um, I don't have a great answer for that again, but the idea is to back away from impact a little bit and try to use some of those proxies. I think there are proxies that we know are pretty close to the impact that we're trying to have and may not bring about some conflicting elements, and then there are others that are maybe more murky. So just trying to focus on those that are more concrete and don't have that sort of negative implication or, or potential that some of the other metrics would, if that makes sense. So I'm from the, I'm I'm from the Bay Area where you know we have a lot of like small AR groups that uh, you know basically gather via meetup uh, groups or uh, Facebook groups, and so they don't have really like the the resources uh, to you know to create the kinds of surveys you are talking about. You know some of the, the things that are measurable like volunteer hours and and things like that. And so uh, are there templates then? Uh, that exist that can be maybe made into like a, a web app or something like that that you know would be very simple for like um, you know somebody who's just starting out like somebody goes home uh, today and starts a meetup group about AR activity in their area so if you have any tools resources or uh, you know movement in that direction I'll, I'll let Allison speak to it as well, but just first off, don't reinvent the wheel. As Allison said, borrow from what other people are doing, certainly. So whether it's a study in our database, ACE covers a lot of research on their website, Humane League Labs does some stuff. So look to what else, else has been done and how applicable it is to what you're doing if you don't have the resources to do it yourself. And then in terms of templates, I mean, the logic model, just laying out, for instance, the different components of a program and identifying your long-term goal, costs no resources other than time, right? But it's going in and filling out those blanks and identifying those assumptions where you might need more resources to bear. So I would say borrow templates from other nonprofit sectors because they will apply in many of the same ways as us. Logic model originated in other social service sectors and the end goal is really behavior change. So it's, a, it's very applicable to a lot of what we're trying to do. Anything to add? <laughs> Just to uh, just okay. to add to the uh, question, maybe clarify a little bit. Uh, you know, like uh, so, like if I go to you know uh, uh, Humane League's website, like like you know, will I? F I mean, I won't find a template there, right? As to like how they are doing it. So like, how do I replicate that? 
Oh, a, a template for the actual research side of things? Yeah, like, you know, I mean, like create a logbook that says, oh, okay, we have so many volunteer hours that volunteered X number of hours this week. You know, I mean, that's something very straightforward, but like, what are sort of the, the, the finer details of like some, you know, uh, just grassroots organization, you know, with maybe a handful of people might not think about, you know, so it'd be good to, for them to have something like that, the template. Sure, and I, I think we sort of have that, but it's in a very general sense, right? It's not a single template, um, and maybe that's something we could work on together, I don't know. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a good idea. Um, it's, it, the problem is, is that it's very nuanced for all the different programs. And so you'd need to create something either quite generic or have adaptations of it in order to have it be relevant to different areas. But I, I think it's interesting. And um, I, I do think that some of the stuff that we pointed out in, in our presentations can be applied as well. At least I hope so. I also think that right now you're at the Animal Rights Conference and it's a great opportunity for you to go up to leaders in some of these groups that do similar activities and ask them what they're tracking. Um, so Humane League is actually a really good example because they have grassroots chapters in many cities. Um, and so they might be doing similar things and tracking similar things to what you'd be interested in tracking. Hi. Um, so. Uh, it sort of sounds like maybe the larger organizations might have um, kind of an advantage in this field and that they can afford to do this research. So does that mean like as a donor, you know, I should maybe consider that um, sort of a point in their favor over the smaller organizations in terms of where to send the money to be most effective? If they're a larger organization that you see is doing this research, then yes. <laughs> Um, that is an advantage to working at a larger scale is that it's more reasonable to track in more depth what you're doing and to refine your program to the most efficiency that you can reach. Um, but it's not a given that just because an organization has a large budget, they are doing a really good job of following up on all their programs. So that's something to look into separately for individual organizations. And I would say an additional filter is what do they do with the information? If they're sharing it with the movement and being transparent, that adds a lot more value than if they're just using it internally. Well, thank you. Thank you, everyone.